Hello everybody, my name is Vicki Bone. I'm the destination expert on board the beautiful Caribbean Princess. And today I'm really excited to present to you Halifax, Nova Scotia, especially because this is where I live. I live about an hour and a half outside of Halifax. So welcome to my home. This is where we'll find Halifax facing the Atlantic Ocean, now, Halifax is one of Canada's fastest growing municipalities. Population of Halifax is just under half a million people. Halifax consists of four separate municipalities that were amalgamated back in 1996. So there's Halifax proper, Dartmouth, Bedford and Halifax County. And this is exactly right where we dock here, right where the arrow is. For some of the history here, well, it goes way, way back. The Mi'kmaq were residing here in Nova Scotia, in New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, since long before any European landed in North America. But the first European to settle here in Nova Scotia was on the um, on the. Uh, Nova Scotia Basin where um, the Bay of Fundy comes in and that was Samuel de Champlain. He traveled over here 1604. He visited all of Nova Scotia, the coast of New Brunswick and then down along Maine as well. He settled in an area called Port Royal. That was his first settlement in Nova Scotia and he set up the very first agricultural settlement on of Europeans on soil which is now part of Nova Scotia, Canada. It, it did have quite a, a broken existence for about eight years. It was really hard to get um, to get through those winters. They relied heavily on the native population. And later they moved across the basin over to Annapolis Royal where they set up a more permanent fort. In the spring of 1710, Queen Anne placed Colonel Francis Nicholson in command of the troops that were intended for settlement of Nova Scotia. He gathered an army of about 1,500 soldiers. He got these from some of the New England states. And this British fleet gathered in the Boston Harbor. They, they sailed up the coast. They landed in Port Royal um, and Annapolis Royal on October 5th. The troops landed, they laid siege, and well, it was a pretty much a foregone conclusion. With 1,500 people with their, against a small troop of French, it was um, pretty well, um, the results were, were inevitable. Five days later, they had a preliminary proposals were exchanged, and it was agreed that the French ruled garrison would march out they would uh, march out with honors of war and they'd be transported to France in English ships. Now the first permanent European settlement in the region was in Halifax and they established the town of Halifax in 1749. It was named Halifax in honor of the second Earl of Halifax. And this led to the colonial capital being transferred from a French uh, town in Annapolis Royal to Halifax, Nova Scotia. On December 6th of 1917, Nova Scotia witnessed the greatest disaster in Canadian history. It's when the SS Mont Blanc, which was a French cargo ship, was carrying munitions, uh, collided with a Belgian relief vessel called the SS Imo in the narrows between Upper Halifax and the Bedford Basin with Dartmouth, Dartmouth just on the other side. The explosion killed about 2,000 people. It injured over 9,000 others. And the blast was the largest artificial explosion before the development of nuclear weapons. Now, people from the Boston area, um, the medical team from Harvard came. We had a lot of engineers, construction workers. They came and ate, 
provided aid and assistance within a few hours uh, to Nova Scotians in Halifax after the explosion. So every year, Nova Scotia sends a Christmas tree to Boston, including during the years of the pandemic. And it's been sent down to Nova, uh, Boston yeah, Christmas tree gets put into the Boston Commons and it's lit every year. And again, it's a thank you from the people in Halifax for everything that they did for us. The urban area of Halifax is a very large economic centre in eastern Canada. It has a large concentration of government services, you know, private sector companies have their eastern branch in this location, and it serves as the business, banking, government and cultural centre for the maritime region. Nova Scotian uh, economy is based on a few things, agriculture, a lot of farming here, fishing, mining, forestry, natural gas extractions are major resource uh, industries that are found all over Nova Scotia. Uh, tourism is growing rapidly too and in fact this year we're going to see 191 cruise ships with over 300,000 cruise guests stop here. Now people ask me all the time about the Titanic and how it's connected with Halifax. Well, when the Titanic struck the iceberg on April 14th at 11.40 p.m., uh, it ended up uh, sinking. Um, and by 2.20 in the morning, uh, the whole ship was gone. Now, the White Star Line, who owned the Titanic at the time, dispatched uh, four Canadian vessels to look for bodies in the area. And those four vessels came from Halifax. On April 17th, uh, the Halifax-based cable steamer McKay Bennett, it set sail with a minister, an undertaker, uh, a cargo full of ice, there were coffins and canvas bags. Now the ship arrived at the site on April 20th and they spent five days carrying out the grim task. The majority of the bodies that they retrieved were unloaded at the coal um, or flagship wharf in Halifax's waterfront. Horse-drawn hearses brought victims to temporary morgues. On two of the 209 bodies that were brought into Halifax, 150 were laid to rest in three cemeteries in Halifax. Now you might wonder about the remaining bodies. Well, they ended up being claimed by family or loved ones. So if the bodies, they could determine where, if they were non-denominational, they ended up going to Fairview Lawn Cemetery where they were buried, which has most of the buried um, victims there. If they were Catholic, they went to Mount Olivet Cemetery, and if they were Jewish, they went to Baron de Hirsch Cemetery. So most of the gravestones that were erected in the fall of 1912 were paid for by the White Star Line. The White Star Line paid for plain granite block, um, but there are some that are a little bit more elaborate and that's because some of the families ended up paying for a little bit more elaborate one. There is a very popular gravestone. It's the uh, gravestone of a gentleman by the name of Jay Dawson. They, uh, of course, the Titanic movie that James Cameron put on, uh, it portrayed a character, Leonard DiCaprio played him, called Jack Dawson, but it, it's fictional, so but it's a very popular grave site that people love to go and see. Now, Fairview Lawn Cemetery is a distance away. Uh, you, it's about a 20-minute drive away, um, really not walkable. Uh, but there's a lot of places uh, that you can ha you can get there, like by a taxi or on a tour. The There's a hop-on, hop-off bus that I'm going to talk a little bit about, and they also take you there if you're interested. And what's nice is a part of the hop-on, hop-off tour includes a little bit of a tour that takes you in and around the cemetery. The Maritime Museum is another spot. Like if you're really into some of the Titanic history, you can go to the, the uh, Maritime Museum of the Atlantic right on the Halifax waterfront. And they have the largest permanent display uh, and probably the finest collection of some of the Titanic memorabilia, their artifacts and so forth that you can find anywhere in the world. For food and drink, well, 
Lobster really is great here. You can get its famous uh, lobster. In fact, um, can be very reasonably priced compared to some of the other places. The whole different array to try it. You have chowders, you can get a lobster roll, a uh, whole lobster, different pasta dishes with lobster. But uh, here we make it with a mayonnaise. You're not going to find the drawn butter version of it, but it's very, very good. And market price, you're looking probably about 27 to 30 Thirty dollars for, like, say, uh, a lobster roll, depending how much lobster meat is inside of it. Another thing that we're famous for here is Digby scallops. They're world famous all over, very succulent, very fresh. They're caught off the shores of the Bay of Fundy in the town called Digby. You can get them all over Nova Scotia. Very huge. You can see how big they are compared to those smaller scallops. So if you're into scallops, you might want to try a good feed of Digby scallops. Uh, Dawn Air. Well, a Dawn Air is sort of what other places refer to as a gyro. Yeah, um, it's, so it's like a shaved, um, you know, it's meat that's cooked on a spit and then they shave it off and they put it into a pita and they put onions and tomatoes and stuff. But then they have this thing called this sweet garlic sauce. So it's not like a tzatziki and that is really, really good to try. But even better is a Donair pizza. So when I didn't live here and I'd come to visit my family, uh, this is always something I had to have on every single visit, a Donair pizza. So it's the same Donair meat that we see in the Donairs. Uh, they put that on a, a cream sauce and then they put the Donair meat cheese and then they sprinkle tomatoes and onions on it and then that garlic cream sauce gets topped all over all of it so it's a very yummy thing to try if you get a hands on it piece my chocolates is a, a syrian canadian chocolatier company and they are based currently in anaganish nova scotia the family has been making chocolate since 1986 uh, in syria but it was bombed because of war and they were forced to leave their home and they lived as refugees in Lebanon for over three years until they immigrated to Anaganish as refugees in Nova Scotia in 2016. And here's a little video about them. Our story is all about the importance of peace. Without peace, there's no life because without peace, no one can go to work. No one can go to school, no one can build businesses, you cannot raise kids, you cannot do anything without peace. My name is Tarek Haddad and I'm originally from Damascus. My father started the chocolate business in Syria in 1986. The company was growing very fast. One morning I heard in the news that there are going to be some explosions and bombs in the area that the factory was. We lost everything basically, we lost the factory, we lost the house. In a blink of an eye, our whole lives in Syria was destroyed. So we decided to leave the country. We started thinking about moving to a country that would give us the human rights, the freedom, and the opportunity to live again. That was absolutely Canada. Canadians are very well known being nice, but Antigonish is extra nice. <laughs> they came to the airport to welcome me and they were carrying flowers and signs. They were saying, welcome to Canada, Tarek. Being welcomed this way really made me feel more confident to launch my life again here in Canada with my family. Building the chocolate business again was a big thing for us because the chocolate is our own way to be grateful for everyone here. That's exactly where we were inspired to call the company Peace by Chocolate. We are trying with every piece of chocolate to reflect something about the culture that we brought to Canada. That's the mission. When we went to the farmer's market, we were very surprised. We saw a line of 200 people, they were waiting for us. And we were sold out in 15 minutes. All right, you are ready. <laughs> that really gave us the first sense of pride of what we are making. It is truly a Canadian story. Our story is all about the importance of peace. Without peace, there's no life. Because without peace, no one can go to work, 
No one can go to school, no one can build businesses, you cannot raise kids, you cannot do anything without peace. My name is Terek Haddad and I'm originally from Damascus. My father started the chocolate business in Syria in 1986. The company was growing very fast. One morning, I heard in the news that there are going to be some explosions and bombs in the area that the factory was. We lost everything, basically. We lost the factory, we lost the house. In a blink of an eye, our whole lives in Syria was destroyed. So we decided to leave the country. We started thinking about moving to a country that would give us the human rights, the freedom, and the opportunity to live again. That was absolutely Canada. Canadians are very well known being nice, but Antigonish is extra nice. <laughs> they came to the airport to welcome me, and they were carrying flowers and signs. They were saying, welcome to Canada, Tarek. Being welcomed this way really made me feel more confident to launch my life again here in Canada with my family. Building the chocolate business again was a big thing for us because the chocolate is our own way to be grateful for everyone here. That's exactly where we were inspired to call the company Peace by Chocolate. We are trying with every piece of chocolate to reflect something about the culture that we brought to Canada. That's the mission. When we went to the farmer's market, we were very surprised. We saw a line of 200 people, they were waiting for us. And we were sold out in 15 minutes. All right, you are ready. <laughs> that really gave us the first sense of pride of what we are making. In fact, it's so hugely successful that they now have two stores. They have a store at Anaganish, but they also have a store right downtown in Halifax. And they also, um, he's written a book about his journey and the story and hat. And it, they even made a movie about it. Now, it used to be on your um, on-demand TV, so you might want to see if you can find it there. But it's a lovely story, heart-wrenching. You can you can easily go down there, go along the waterfront. This is a picture of my friend Paul right in front of it. And you can buy some of their really great tasting chocolates. And what I love is they have uh, the word peace in numerous languages. So you get to share that beautiful message of peace. But they're just lovely people. And so literally just turn right, walk down the boardwalk, and you'll come across Peace by Chocolates. Now, I've talked about Beaver Tales before, and it was started in uh, Ottawa, late 70s, and it quickly spread from coast to coast. And now it's kind of a tradition, especially, uh, you know, when you go out for uh, a stroll or say if you're going out in the cold, you'd go to one of the shacks that sells the Beaver Tales. It's basically fried dough. Uh, and they stretch it out, looks like a beaver tail, so that's how it got its name. Now, traditionally, it is just with cinnamon and sugar and butter, but they have all different kinds of toppings that you can put on it. But I just like the simple, traditional one, and you can get it. Now, there is some food stalls that you'll find all along the waterfront, and there is one that sells specifically beaver tails. We make some excellent wines here, characteristic of our cool climate and, you know, the um, the seafood. It makes a great spot to try some really great wines. Now, one of the wines that is made here in Nova Scotia is called Tidal Bay. It's a, it's a type of wine. It's a very unique wine uh, influenced by the sea. It's kind of got a fresh fruity, green apple-y taste, uh, low acid. And it's um, it's a, a lovely wine to pair with uh, your meal. And I'd highly encourage you to try it if you're going in for a meal. Ask for a glass of, if not the Tidal Bay, at least a local wine here. Alexander Keats is a brewery. It opened up in 1820, and it's one of the oldest breweries in North America. You can visit it, you can do a tour. They have guided, they do guided tours of the facilities. There's actors in period costumes. They take you out to historic property. They tell you about the history of the company and they always end with a really great um, beer tasting. This is all combined. They usually have music and entertainment. You need to book these tours though ahead of time. 
you have to go just to their website, Alexander Keats Brewery in Halifax, and you can book that. But it's a lot of fun. But one of the things I love especially is they had a really great series of commercials about Alexander Keats beer. And it always focused around this one character. And here is just one of the commercials. We've just run out of Keats draft. Out of Keats? Out of Keats! The, the pride of Nova Scotia since 1820, Alexander Keats died for that beer, and you let the tax man drive! Everyone, rise up! We must go! Everyone, who's with me? Who's with me? Bottle okay? Oh, bottle, yes. <laughs> oh, crap! All right, look away. Look away. It still makes me laugh. Uh, again, there are so many sites to see here. I cannot cover them all, but I'm going to cover the main ones to see. So if you there's something else and I don't cover it, come see me at my desk. I'll try to help you. Now, first off, the sailing in is lovely. You're coming into this very long, uh, narrow channel. If you're not up early enough for see the sail in, definitely be out to see the sail away. We dock right in the town again, city. It's easy to get around if you're just on foot and you want to explore on your own. That is easy to do as well. One spot I would definitely recommend is to go to um, the Maritime Museum. Uh, Nova Scotia has a very rich maritime heritage that uh, you can learn much more about it than any talk that I can give. And you can go there, you can... Um, see things like small crafts, um, boat building, uh, the different things that happened during the World Wars. Uh, the Titanic exhibit that I mentioned is here. The Halifax explosion, there are some uh, artifacts there as well. And it's open every day, uh, 8.30 to 5. It's located right on the waterfront. And it's about $10 Canadian to get inside. And there is even an, a boat on the waterfront that you get to go and explore as well. Maritime Museum, if you walk all along the boardwalk, you're going to come right across the Maritime Museum. Now, Pier 21 is kind of like what I would say is uh, our Ellis Island of the United States. So Pier 21 is the museum of the story of immigration to Canada uh, for immigration from coast to coast to coast. And you can go there and you can step into and and experience what these people went through for over, uh, well, over a million people came through these doors between 1928 and 1971 when it closed its doors late 1971. And it's really, uh, really well done. There's a lot of very moving exhibits. You get to learn about all those that came through the doors, what they went through, what the procedures were. Um, and it's a lovely national historic site. It's open every day. It doesn't open till like around 9.30 or 10. And about $15 Canadian to get in for an adult price located literally right across from where we dock it's it's actually connected the port building is connected to Pier 21 and if you can uh, and you're not going into Pier 21 there is a lovely statue right on the war boardwalk and that one was done by uh, Armando Barbon and he created this statue called the immigrant and it was erected in honor of all those that pass through the doors of Pier 21. Now, the Halifax Citadel is the um, a fort that is on the very large hill that overlooks the harbor. So it was a great defense spot because it was a, a great view of the harbor. You could see everything and uh, everything below. And because of the fort, that led to the foundation and the forming of the city of Halifax in 1749. In fact, the Citadel was one of the first buildings ever to be constructed here. They built the wooden guardhouse on top of the hill. And then it eventually was called Citadel Hill. And the Halifax's first settlers started building homes in and around the hill, closer to the waterfront. And as the fort grew, so did the town, because the town ended up taking care of the needs and supplies of the soldiers, you know, things for both essential supplies, but then other things like off-duty recreation. 
Today, the Halifax Citadel continues to watch over the city's downtown court. The present Citadel was completed in 1856, and it's actually the fourth in a series of forts to sit atop what is now known as Citadel Hill. It's officially called Fort George, named after Britain's King George III, and it has that distinctive star shape, which was quite typical of many 19th century forts built by the British military, and it gave the garrison a, a really good sweeping um, arc uh, for fire and with their cannons in case of enemy forces. But Halifax was never um, attacked, so it never actually saw um, any um, attacks from, from other sources. It is the 78th Highlanders and the Royal Artillery that are, still guard the Citadel today. You see them dressed in the same uniforms that they did um, back then, um, respective regiments wore in the mid-1800s. There's always a guard at the entrance to the citadel. They also do marching and drills and stuff on the parade grounds. And they also do a tradition since 1857, and it's one of the oldest in the world. It's when they fire the cannon off um, every single day at noon. And it's the 3rd Brigade Royal Artillery that announce it. And you'll hear it all throughout the city. Now you can go uh, up to the Citadel. They have an excellent museum where you can learn a lot about the fort, the soldiers who were stationed here. You can walk uh, uh, into many of the different rooms. Um, they have a really good video inside as well. And you learn and get really good um, piece of Halifax's military history. They have offer guided tours as well. Um, and they are led by people in period costumes. There's a sign that's posted there when the guided tours will start. The Halifax Citadel isn't far from the port, but it is uphill. So it's open nine to five every single day. It's 1250 to get in. If you're here after September 16th, then it drops in price to 850 because it's not high season. Uh, like I said, it's uphill so I would say if you had to maybe take a taxi up to the top maybe up to the public gardens then off to the citadel and then kind of walk back if you wanted to at the front of the citadel going towards downtown you're going to see the Halifax Tower clock now this clock was commissioned by Prince Edward Duke of Kent who was Queen Victoria's father and it was created with the idea of a clock for the garrison at Halifax because the soldiers were always tardy so he arranged for this turret clock to be manufactured before he returned back to England in 1800. Now the tower is a uh, three-tiered or three and three-story irregular octog octagon tower built atop a one-story white clappered building and it began keeping time for the garrison on October 20th of 1803. Uh, we talk about this a lot, but this is our province house. This is our legislative building. They meet every, they've been meeting here ever since 1819, making it the longest serving legislative building in Canada. And you can actually go in and visit it. If we're there during uh, a weekday, you can visit it between 8.30 and 4. It is open to the public. And you can learn about the history and the architecture and the features of this beautiful um, national historic site. The art gallery is right beside that, not too far away. And you can go in here and learn about um, some of the art and artists from the whole Atlantic region, actually. Very historic art pieces. They have 17,000 iconic artworks that reflect, you know, Nova Scotia's culture. And it's a great uh, spot to see exhibits of a lady named Maud Lewis. She's a very iconic Nova Scotia artist. And She's famous. They actually did a movie of her um, with um, 
Ethan Hawke and Sally Hawkins. They did a movie called Maudie, which is a lovely story of her. And you, when you're walking along the boardwalk, you're going to see, I think there's at least two of these framed pictures uh, that Maude Lewis did. And you can actually pose in those pictures. There's my friend Megan and Paul. And then St. Paul's Church, which is the oldest building in Halifax. It's also the oldest existing Protestant um, place of worship in Canada. And it was founded by proclamation of King George II in 1749, the same year as the Halifax colony was formed. This church survived the Halifax explosion of 1917, just had some windows blown out, but it was designated a National Historic Site of Canada in 1981. Again, go inside. It's a lovely church. Uh, beautiful stained glass windows as well. Now, all the last three sites that I mentioned, Province House, the Art Gallery, and St. Paul's Church, all located right in this region. Very easy to get to as well. If you're more into like being in nature, the gardens, I would highly recommend heading to the Halifax Public Gardens. It's a Victoria era public gardens uh, established in 1867, the year of Canadian Confederation. The gardens were designed as a national, his, designated a national historic site in 1984. And I love they have one hour um, tours, historical and horticultural tours here. And uh, they are, they run daily. Um, different times and if you want to reserve a spot you have to go onto their website and just reserve a spot uh, I wouldn't necessarily take a chance that there'll be space necessarily when you get there but you could but it's easy to stroll around the gardens and see the sites there the Halifax Public Gardens located about a half an hour walk from the pier and they open up at 8 a.m. now again it is uphill Take your time. If you head up Spring Garden Road, then it shouldn't be too hard. You can kind of take your time and maybe grab a coffee along the way. And take your uh, take a breath. Now, going a little bit further afield, this is a town called Lunenburg, and it was founded in 1753. And the town was one of the very first British attempts to settle the Protestants in Nova Scotia. Now, if you remember, I mentioned that Nova Scotia was mainly settled by the French and Acadians. When the British took over, they needed to populate the area with English speaking people that were Protestant. So this is one of the spots that they did that. In Lüneburg, um, in 1995, it was considered a UNESCO designated World Heritage Site. And it's the best example of planned British colonial settlement in North America. And it still retains its original layout and appearance uh, of the 1800s. Beautiful shops, a lovely like art galleries, local crafts that are in the area. You'll see uh, fish um, um, fishing boats, um, also um, businesses that actually build boats here, boat building and so forth here. It's a lovely spot to tour around. You can get local crafts, uh, local coffee shops. There's lots of great restaurants, great seafood here as well. And I love eating right on the pier there. That's a lovely spot. One thing that Lunenburg is famous for, like I said, is boat building. And the Blue Nose uh, was a fishing and a racing um, schooner that they built here. Built in 1921 in Lunenburg, it was a celebrated racing ship and fishing vessel. Uh, Blue Nose was commanded uh, by Angus Walters, and it became a provincial icon for Nova Scotia and a very important Canadian symbol uh, in the 1930s. It was put onto a stamp, and also if you look at our Canadian dime, it has the Blue Nose on it. Here's a little video all about the Blue Nose. should never have agreed to this last race. She's too old. Eddie! Come look at this! Dr. Halyard, Get to it, Matt! Here, 
appears there's some kind of difficulty. Just one more, old girl, and you can rest. <laughs> Last race and still undefeated. The Blue Nose out of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia was fastest in the world for almost 20 years. Now, the uh, she was a working vessel until she was wrecked in a storm in 1946. And she was commemorated by a replica that was built called the Blue Nose 2. And that was built in 1963. Now, the Blue Nose 2 can be actually seen uh, often in Lunenburg. In the summer months, it travels around. and it, uh, But I think it's going to be in Blue Nose um, um, and it and if you get there and it's open, you can go on board and you can go and see her and uh, experience her and so forth. But they do lovely sailing. Last year, I got the I got a great opportunity to actually go out sailing on the Blue Nose too. Now, Lunenburg is a distance away. Uh, definitely want to be uh, part of a tour uh, to go out there. It's about an hour and a half away, but it's a lovely spot to head to. Another spot um, popular is called Mahone Bay, in, and this was in 1754, like I said, the British were wanting to colonize the area, and so they brought over a lot of Germans from Europe to, you know, live here. Uh, and they settled in this area in Lunenburg, which was pretty much a very much a German uh, town. A lot of language was spoken in German. And for many, many years, it's a really beautiful town, a very tranquil, beautiful, stunning old Victorian mansions. There's lots of like local crafts, uh, a lot of different um, items that, you know, forebar forefathers would make, you know, rug hooking, quilting, um, pewter, so forth, pottery, and all that. So I love going here, but they also have some really great restaurants and bars, and they say that they've got some of the friendliest people as well. To get to Mahone Bay, again, it's about an hour past Peggy's Coast, so about an hour and a half you're, it's going to take you, an hour and 20 minutes or so. Lovely, lovely spot to go to. And of course, Peggy's Cove, it's iconic here. Nova Scotia, though, has over 160 lighthouses, but the world famous Peggy's Cove is probably the most photographed lighthouse in Canada. Uh, the lighthouse at Peggy's Cove was built in 1915. Now, when you get there, um, it's been recently renovated. So if you haven't been there in the last few years, uh, it's a really, what they've done with it is really quite nice. Uh, renovated in 2021, and it's totally 100% accessible for everybody now. Wonderful pathways that kind of reflect the sea, the clouds, uh, and the waves. Uh, I think it's really quite beautiful. And so you can easily walk up close to the, the lighthouse now, I will warn people that there are areas that are clearly defined that you should not walk on the rocks. And that is important because, well, one, it's very, very windy there. And also the waves can come and crash up onto the rocks. And sometimes there's some rogue waves that are totally unexpected. And they have been known to wash people into the water if you are walking in areas that you're not allowed to. Every single year there seems to be somebody. So please exercise caution. Stick only to the paths that they tell you you can walk on. But you know enjoy the views here. They're absolutely beautiful. Peggy's Cove is about 26 miles or 43 kilometers. Uh, it's about an hour away because there's not like it's a major highway that you're going through there. It's small, uh, you know, two lane road, uh, but a really cute town as well. There's some nice little restaurants. There's a gift shop there right at the um, the site. And I've been warned, uh, I've been informed from previous tours that if you're going to Peggy's Cove and you arrive there, time is limited go and spend the time around the lighthouse, seeing the site and all that, then go into the shop and buy some shop uh, souvenirs or if you want to grab something to eat. But almost always people will go into the shops and then they just don't have the time to explore Peggy's Cove. But it's a beautiful little town as well. 
Now, just past Peggy's Cove, um, there was an event that happened here on September 2nd of 1998. It's when the Swiss Air Flight 111 crashed into St. Margaret's Bay. And not far, only five miles from Peggy's Cove. Now, everybody that was on board perished. Uh, 229 people died. But the cove became one of the staging areas for first responders that were involved in the search and rescue and response. And the crash and recovery operation and the investigation that happened here. Uh, many of the volunteers that were the very first to arrive at the, co at the crash site were people that lived in the area they were privately owned fishing boats that when they heard the call were the first to head out there um, to the harbor and to find anybody that they could also the area was um, the families and loved ones of the people that were on that flight traveled into the area here and they were welcomed with open arms and so it's, it's a special special site and they built this beautiful memorial that was erected that you can go to and you can actually see in the top picture there I'm taking that picture from the memorial and you can see Peggy's Cove there just in the distance so it's not very far but it's a beautiful site unfortunately if you're on a big bus tour they can't go there because the parking lot isn't very big but if you're on a rental car or you're part of a small group tour that you've organized just travel it's only a couple miles from Peggy's Cove and I encourage you to go visit it not to mention the beautiful vistas that you'll see there well Annapolis Valley this is a special part of my heart because this is where I currently live this was first settled by the French when they came over to North America in 1605 and French-speaking Acadians spread throughout the valley. The Acadians were an initial group of about 50 French families that settled in the region and over the well, a couple of generations uh, spread out to be about 2,000 people that settled in this area. It is a spot today where, well, we grow the most vegetables and fruit. Uh, it's called the breadbasket of Nova Scotia, and it's because it's kind of sheltered by two mountain ridges. So it kind of provides a microclimate and um, kind of mild temperatures, but perfect for growing vegetables and fruits. They have a famous apple crop here. They host um, um, over like a thousand farms of various types here, uh, most of them being relatively small farm owned operations. It's about an hour away from Halifax if you're heading into the sites there in Annapolis Valley. But the whole valley actually encompasses quite a large area. But in the Annapolis Valley, we grow grapes. We make fabulous wine here. There's numerous wineries, large, small, um, and, you know, you can go on a wine tour and experience some of the wineries in the area. I love it. This is actually my favorite winery, 1365 Church Street. You can buy their wines in the wineries, but I love visiting. It's a very small family-owned winery, and I bought this bag there, and the bag on it says fresh vegetables. Who am I kidding? It's wine. <laughs> Lots of activities to do here. Well, one of the most popular ones is the hop on hop off bus. You get to go on this vintage double decker bus. So it is vintage. It's not like a fancy Greyhound bus, but it's a lot of fun. And you get to travel along the historic and evolving downtown past a lot of stunning sites, including they have a stop at the Public Gardens. They have a stop at the Citadel. Uh, they stop um, many different spots all around. They also go to Fairview Lawn Cemetery to see the resting place for uh, many of the people who perished uh, during the Titanic sinking. And there's a guide that's going to be there. Now, you need to buy your tickets from Shore Excursions. Now, I recommend this because one, uh, space can be limited. Uh, if you go ashore, you can buy it ashore. There is a kiosk right at the pier that you can buy it, but they don't take t credit cards. They don't take cash. They're going to charge it to your onboard account. So save the time, not queuing up. You go directly onto the app and book your ticket for the hop on, hop off bus. You will get your um, ticket from the shore excursions, and then you can go and ride your hop on, hop off bus.
They do have um, a harbor hopper tour, so it kind of does a land tour and then it goes into the water and you get to learn because the harbor here is quite interesting as well. For shopping, lots of great shopping here. You can find um, in Mahone Bay is a company called Amos Pewter. So if you're going to Mahone Bay, definitely check out their shop there. But they do have a shop right on the waterfront, right in the heart of Halifax. And you can buy some of their, well, they they have handcrafted pieces of pewter that reflect nature, um, seaside, and the surroundings here in Nova Scotia. I especially love many of their Christmas ornaments. I always get them and my Christmas tree is adorned with them. But there's lots of shopping, again, all along the waterfront, um, in downtown. And if you're traveling up Spring Garden Road, say up to the public gardens, lovely shops, local clo clothing items, a lot of stuff that has nautical themes. And I took a picture of uh, a cap that says Oak Island. And I get a lot of people asking me about Oak Island because of the TV show for which I have never seen, but I can tell you that, yeah, you can do tours to Oak Island, but it's very difficult to do with the limited time we're in port. So you're gonna have to come back to Nova Scotia, back to Halifax and visit Oak Island, but you could buy a hat that says Oak Island on it. Uh, you can walk along the waterfront, beautiful boardwalk, it's usually teeming with people just hanging out for the day. Lovely big chairs, hammocks, restaurants, bars, shopping. You know, there's volleyball nets. And, you know, it's just a fun place to hang out. At last time we were here, um, we saw there was a uh, the Gloria ship was in port, but also sometimes the Blue Nose is in port. I think it's, um, I checked the schedule. I'm not sure. I believe it's here in late September. But you'll find people playing music. There'll be the Maude Lewis paintings. You can see that's my husband kind of goofing around with the Maude Lewis painting there. And then lovely art pieces. Um, now, we get hurricanes here. You can see the winds um, actually damage the light post. I'm just kidding. That's actually an art piece. That's how they are built. So, But it's quite funny to take a picture with those. For practical information, while I love it, we dock right downtown, right at Pier 22 Cruise Pavilion. It's a lovely port building, lots of shopping. There's washrooms, uh, Wi-Fi, you know, it's a good good spot. Lots of a great tourist information here as well. They'll provide you with a map and people that are volunteering that can answer your questions as well. Like I mentioned, Pier 21 is literally, this is the door on the right that you come out of the cruise terminal, and right beside it is Pier 21. That's the Museum for Immigration. And like I said, everything is right downtown within walking distance. If you're on a ship's tour, make sure you check your tour ticket to where you're going to meet. If you're um, meeting on board the ship, go to that appropriate lounge. If you're meeting ashore, then you can just meet in the port building. Buses pull right up to the pier, so you're not going to have to walk very far. And there's numerous taxis that are available at the port. Some will uh, offer you a private tour. And the taxis here are regulated, so it's a, a set um, metered price. But you can maybe negotiate something for a tour if you're wanting to do that. There's also Uber here as well. We're still in Canada, so we're dealing with the Canadian currency, uh, $1.3 uh, American. Um, one US dollar gives 1.32 Canadian. Lots of ATMs and banks. Uh, American is accepted a little bit more here in Halifax, but again, not a good exchange rate. You might want to pay with a debit or credit card to get the bank rate for exchange. Now, if you're wanting to watch this, you might be already watching this on your TV, but uh, if you're wanting to watch this, you go to My Cruise on the left side, you click the Shore Excursions and Destination tab, and then it will open up another window, which then will show all of my port talks right there, and you can watch them at your leisure and learn about the ports that we're visiting. Uh, again, desk hours. On the back of the Princess Powder is my desk hours. I'm there every day for one hour. My desk is right beside the shore excursions. I don't work for shore excursions. I don't 
answer really questions about shore excursions. I don't want to give you the wrong information, but I can help you about the ports of call and what to see and how to get there and so forth. And if you want, I can maybe assist you with, you know, choosing something on the shore excursion list. So head out, enjoy your time in Halifax. And my quote for today is traveling. It leaves you speechless and then turns you into a storyteller. Thank you for spending some time with me today. Enjoy your day.